Welcome to the third Artist at the Institute lecture of the academic year. My name is Jeffrey Uslip, and I'm one of the co-chairs of this evening's student-run lecture series. Tonight, we have the honor of hearing a presentation from Chaim Steinbach. Following Chaim's talk, there will be a question and answer session and an informal reception across the hall at the Loeb Room. Shortly after receiving his MFA from Yale University in 1973, Steinbach began exhibiting his work at institutions ranging from artist space to Cornell University, where he also taught. His work was included in some of the most seminal exhibitions of the 1980s, including David Jocelyn and Elizabeth Sussman's landmark exhibition, Endgame, Thomas Lawson's Pop Project, Documenta 9, and Howard Howley's Objects in Collision at the Kitchen. More recently, Steinbeck was included in Helen Molesworth's exhibition, This Will Have Been, Art, Love, and Politics in the 1980s, and he will have an upcoming survey this summer at Bard College. If the picture's generation before him focused their attention on representations of the real, Steinbeck's work prioritizes the real thing itself. In Hayam's work, the objects that surround us, our collaborators in daily life, serve as emblems of our cultural framework. Through his selection and arrangement of material objects on Formica shelves, Steinbeck simultaneously reassigns value to material objects while bringing their anthropological, cultural, and aesthetic nuances to the fore. In Hayam's hands, a Kong dog chew toy, a rubber Yoda mask, lava lamps, Nike Air Jordan sneakers, and an Everlast medicine ball reveal the ironic, humorous, and sometimes darker psychological context of cultural production. Operating with acute precision, Hayam's shelf arrangements demonstrate the shifting implications of and possibilities for material objects in art. Please join me in welcoming Hayam Steinbeck. Hello. Um, I would like to thank uh, Jeffrey, Uslip, and Anne Wheeler, as well as the New York University Institute of Fine Arts uh, for inviting me to talk to you t tonight. I met Jeffrey six years ago. When he called to invite me to a show he was curating at Artist Space in New York. Oh, it's up there already. Okay, um, this is the catalog cover of the show at Artist Space. Uh, Jeffrey asked me for a work I made in 1988 titled Untitled Elephant Footstools, Elephant Skull. Um, in his, um, yeah, in his catalog I said Jeffrey wrote, Heim Steinbach's Untitled Elephant Footstool, Elephant Skull consists of his two wedges one supporting a vintage tuskless elephant skull, the other holding footstools constructed from five elephant feet covered with zebra skin. Untitled Elephant Footstools, Elephant Skull is a perverse vision of otherness, highlighting the impossibility for this trophy to have five feet. Steinbach's artwork implies that at least two elephants were implicated in the slaughter. The story of untitled elephant foot to elephant skull is similar to Rauschenberg's painting, Canyon, 1959. One day early in 1988, I was walking up 2nd Avenue. When around 56th Street, I stopped at a store named Hemingway African Gallery. There was a small window display on the street with African artifacts artifacts, carved totems, jewelry, etc. Descending a set of steps down below street level, I found myself in a cramped space where at one point I stumbled up upon a strange massive skull under the table. It was an un uncanny thing. I couldn't tell what it was. The first thing that came to mind was hippopotamus, but 
then it seemed way too big. Then a few minutes later, I noticed several elephant feet somewhere else on the floor. Looking closely, I discovered the feet had round cushions on top with zebra hide covering. They were seats that actually made me think more of footstools. That's when it occurred to me that the skull must be that of an elephant. I got down on my knees and recognized the holes below from where the tusks had been removed. A few days after returning home, the elephant body parts kept coming to mind. And then it occurred to me that I must make a work with them. I called the store and to my dismay was told by the owner that the skull had just been sold to Michael Jackson. <laughs> but then he added that, quote, I have another one not as big, but just as good. The work was shown at Jay Gorney Modern Art in New York that same year. It was then flown to the CAPC Musée d'Art Contemporain in Bordeaux, France, where I had the first survey exhibition of my work. It returned to New York afterwards. In 1991, the work was flown back to Europe this time for uh, the International Art Exhibition, Metropolis, at the Martin Gropius Bau, that was in Berlin. Uh, there, the work was confiscated by the German Wild Wildlife Protection Agency and held at German Customs for several years until I enlisted a lawyer to help me retrieve the work. When the work was sent back to the US, it was confiscated by US Customs. It took a good year to get them to release the work, and when they did, it was under the condition that it be donated to, U to a US museum and never sent out of the country. The work is now with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. This is another work from the same period, 1988. In fact, this is also a work that was exhibited at the uh, my survey show at the museum in Bordeaux, the CAPC. And uh, this is also another work from that same period, which also was exhibited together with the elephant in the same area at that show. Ten days ago, I participated in a panel discussion at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston on the occasion of the closing of Helen Wallaceworth's exhibition this will have been Art, Love, and Politics in the 1980s. The show opened a year ago at the Museum of Contemporary Art, then traveled to the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and finally ended at the ICA. Helen had intended for the panel to, exa to examine this will have been through the lens of the Endgame exhibition at the ICA in 1986, and or vice versa. Endgame was one of the most important exhibitions, or I would say symposiums, in the 80s, as it was more of a discussion among some of the leading art historians about their ideas on issues around the works than the works in their own right. The invited panelists were, uh, this is back to the ICA, uh, panel discussion um, 10 days ago. The invited panelists were David Jocelyn and Elizabeth Sussman, curators of Endgame, and Louise Lawler, myself, as well as Helen, who moderated the discussion. Unfortunately, Elizabeth had to cancel at the last minute, and the intention of the discussion did not materialize. I was left alone to address the subject. Uh, I'll return to this shortly. The work you see here, untitled Cabbage Pumpkin's Pictures. Uh, again, untitled Cabbage Pumpkin Pictures, 1986. Um, it consists of a ceramic cabbage soup tureen that I bought in Venice, Italy in 1986, a hallmark synthetic material pumpkin from Halloween 1986, and three ceramic whole water pictures that have been with me for quite a few years before. The objects are simply placed on the architectural unit that I designed. Over the years, different people have responded differently to the work. 
one person went to the receptionist at the gallery and asked how much for a picture. Another thought the artist made the objects and seemed somewhat dismayed to find out they were, they were the real thing. Another kept calling the pitcher a teapot, and still another walked away with the pitcher. However, some New York art historians actually arrived at, a consensus, at the consensus that none of the above made much sense. They called the work simulation. Other experts in the field named it commodity art. Still others agreed it's best to call the thing Neo Geo, because they saw geometric forms. And so the story went. Uh, this is the MCA Chicago installation of This Will Have Been, or at least this is the view uh, with my work in it. When I arrived in Chicago a year ago for the opening of This Will Have Been at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago, I was taken off guard. My work was presented alongside the works of Mary Kelly and Peter Hujar as well as other artists in, the con in a context that was both anthropological as well as aesthetic. My work has always been about the coming together of disparate nomadic objects. However, it has often been presented within a narrow ideological historical art historical script. For instance, consumerism. Helen's installation avoided this kind of trap. Helen Wallaceworth's show was organized around four topics. The end is near, democracy, gender trouble, and desire and longing. While certain works were entered into one category or another, these were not necessarily absolute. For instance, the autoerotic um, work of Peter Hujar installed in Desire and Longing in Chicago on the left side of my work may have also showed up in gender trouble. And Mary Kelly's interim part, uh, Corpus Appell, 1984-85, dealing with women's identity, seen here on the right side of my work, was installed in The End is Near at the Boston ICA show. I could have also seen my work installed in, for instance, democracy. In Boston, my work was installed between a photograph of a home of collectors by Louise Lawler and the autoerotic photographs of Robert Maplethorpe. I don't recall having seen my work installed near the works of these artists, nor discussed in this vein in, in a history book before. What has changed here? Helen titled her exhibition, This Will Have Been, which raises the question, what was that wasn't? For me, Helen Mollersworth's exhibition is the most incisive exhibition to date on the art in the 80s. While it basically focused on the New York art scene, several European and South American artists have also been included. Helen's exhibition is radical in that it recalibrates the reading of mainstream historical narratives. It is an exhibition that probes deeply into the socio-cultural contents of the works of the period, changing the terms of the dialectic. In a text on the work of Louise Lawler published in the art journal Documents in 1999, Helen wrote, much of the critically ambitious art and criticism of the post-war period was shrouded in an anxiety about its potential to be ensconced or subsumed into domestic space. The dire fate of being relegated to a position above the sofa I don't want to argue for any implicit critical potential of the porosity between institutions of commerce and those of art. Surely, we can see 
that this porosity was conductive to business as usual for capitalist profit. Similarly, I don't wish to privilege domestic space against more traditionally conceived public space. Uh, to, I'm sorry, against more traditionally conceived of public space. Rather, my question is what possibilities were foreclosed when art was rendered separate from the contradictions of commodity culture and when critical art was freed from the complications of domestic space? Whose interests were served in the foreclosure of such discussions? More important, how might an acknowledgement of this prior moment alter our version of 20th century art production? For if we open the institutions of art production and reception to include the department store and the living room, then might we be able to ask different questions of, for instance, Duchamp's store-bought ready-mates, Frederick Kiesler's interior design, Brock's use of wallpaper, or the role of women in the formation of modern art museums in the United States. And might it help us better to interrogate what exactly is meant by the often stated avant-garde desire to merge art and life. So here are some examples of works by early 1980s artists. Uh, this is a work by Louise Lawler, it's titled Still Life. Uh, it's from 2003, but Louise was doing work um, of this kind uh, already in the early 80s. Um, this is a studio installation of work by Nancy Shaver. This is uh, Sherry Levine also very early 80s, um, after Walker Evans. Uh, it's the home of sharecroppers. And this is a work of mine from 1980, 1981, titled Shelf Arrangement for Eric's Room in New Rochelle. Towards the end of the 1970s, I began to explore the boundaries between the home, the street, and the museum. In 1979, for a faculty exhibition at the Johnson Museum of Cornell University, I realized the work, display number five. Around that time, I began titling installations I made with objects, displays. Employing Barnett Newman's and Ellsworth, Kelly, as Ellsworth Kelly's paradigm of space distribution across the paintings field, I applied, stri strips of, I applied strips of color and wallpaper patterns across the field of the wall. I then mounted a shelf made of hardware brackets and a one by six piece of lumber. I selected objects from my environment and placed them on the shelf. I chose a niche-like space off to one side of the main exhibition space using the two perpendicular walls for my work. On the vertically sectioned wall, I hung a shirt of mine and placed a child's rubber ball next to a terracotta Mayan replica of a dog belonging to my parents. I wanted to include a sculpture from the museum collection and added the pedestal with the 1950s work of Herbert Ferber. I turned the adjacent recessed wall into a kind of portal. I can't say now why I put the pile of shells at the corner of the bottom, on the bottom. I recall having had a bunch of them in the studio and transported them to the museum. But in retrospect, a shell is after all a home for a creature. And in the end, the work I was doing had everything to do with the home. A shell is also a covering, an exterior surface like that of a shelf laminate. In 19... In 1980, I was offered a show by, by Stefan Eins at his storefront gallery, Fashion Moda, in a rundown neighborhood in the South Bronx. Stefan was hardly there. He gave me the keys to the space for a month. 
and using it as a studio showroom, I produced the work changing displays. Things went up, things went up and down on the walls. Friends and students, friends and students, John Shabel, Shelley Silver, Nancy Shaver, Cindy Tower, Steele Stillman, Julia Wachtel, Robert Gober, Johanna Boyce, among others would stop by occasionally and participate in the work. During my stay at Fashion Moda, I began to question the form of the shelf. A shelf is furniture, a counter for objects and things. It is a unit that mediates the boundary between domestic and public space. And as a spiritual place, it sometimes takes the form of an altar. This was an early shelf work I made at Fashion Moda. It, uh, it's gone, I don't know where it is, destroyed. Um, by the end of my stay, I often narrowed down the work to one object per shelf, giving it the simple title of Shelf With. This work was titled Shelf With Globe. This is Shelf with Ant Roach and Diet 7-Up, 1981. This is Shelf with Annie, also 1981. This is Shelf with Ajax. This is Shelf with Noodle Shoe. My friends, Steel Steelman and Nancy Shaver, drove down to the flea market in Perky Omenville, Perky Omenville, Pennsylvania, and brought me this folk object. Thinking of Judd's reliefs of incremental protrusions and spacings of volumes, I made this shelf for the noodle shoe, titling it Shelf with Noodle Shoe. Next, I, next, I wanted to explore my work in an actual living environment. I asked friends and relatives to let me install one of my works in their home. Once installed, I would take a photograph, which was both a document and a work itself. I then titled the work Shelf Arrangement 4. This is Shelf Arrangement for Helene, Sydney, Amy, and Eric's Playroom in New Rochelle. This is Shelf Arrangement for Jennifer's studio apartment. She was actually living in downtown New York. Uh, in the Wall Street area. This is shelf arrangement for Camille's family living room in Little Italy. Camille was a neighbor of Elizabeth Turner. Elizabeth Turner was the chief assistant of Walter Di Maria. Around that time, I was the um, guard of the New York Earth Room. And um, Elizabeth was chatting me one day with me one day about my work, and she said, "Well, why don't you come and you can put yourself in my house, which I don't have a photograph of that." And then she said, "Gee, you got to meet my neighbors. You know, you wouldn't believe it. it's a fantastic place. It was around Christmas time, and so these were the Italian neighbors that were Elizabeth's neighbors in Little Italy. This is my parents' house in Woodstock. This is shelf arrangement for Isaac and Ruth's bedroom in Woodstock. This is shelf arrangement for Audrey and Dick's card room in, Hamp in Hampton Bays in New York. That's uh, Long Island, 1981. In 1984, I came up with the tri in 1984, I came up with the triangular, uh, triangular wedge formed shelf. I was exploring a system of units for presenting a group of objects, something that traverses institutional formats of furniture, something that goes across artistic, domestic, and public spaces. The result was the 90 degree by 50 degree by 40 degree wedge shelf. The format allowed me to modulate the volumes 
of the sections of the shelf according to the objects presented. Uh, this work is untitled becomes Alter Ego, 1984. The work you see here is in fact a picture it's a representation of a physical three-dimensional work that I made in 1984. The work has little, the work has a title attached to it, which is Uncolor Becomes Alter Ego. I say attached because I didn't make it up. Rather, it is a found object. I took it as is out of a book on interior decoration. In fact, I collect statements, axioms, aphorisms, etc., that I come across in books magazines, and posters. When I do a work and look for objects, I consider my collection of statements as part of the process. When I can't settle on one, I title the work, capital untitled, parentheses, accompanied by a list of the objects, of the objects. I'm considered an 80s artist. What was the 80s? How has it been represented in the art critical discourse? My work consists of the presentation of actual everyday objects. By this I mean objects that circulate in our culture. However, a key word associated with my work has been commodity. I believe that the reason for that was that the 80s became a commodity bat battleground. What is an object, a product, a commodity, and what is art as commodity? Is commodity a raw material or primary agricultural product? Or is it a useful or valuable thing such as water or time? In the 80s, art critical discourse, commodity had simply taken the connotation of a bad name. It carried a distinct negative flavor that implicated money and capitalism with the artwork to which it has been attached. Let's consider the IFA announcement for my talk today. The word commodity appears in the second line. Commodity is used here to describe the work refers um, to the objects stated as commodity objects. The announcement text, use of the word commodity, is complex. It states, Heim Steinbach rose to prominence in the 1980s by creating sculpture in which the latent cultural value and socially critical characteristics of commodity objects were brought to the fore. But it does not explain which commodity objects. And this is the catch. Are these commodity objects? Um, any and all objects available in our, I'm sorry, are these commodity objects any and all objects available in our post-industrial society? Objects that can be bought and sold. Are they objects that are useful and valuable, such as water and time? Are certain objects deemed commodities while others not? Does the announcement suggest that Heim Steinbach's work consists of commodity objects, or does it imply that all artworks are commodities? If we are to consider the term cultural value of commodity objects, as stated in the text, what is meant by cultural value in relation to commodity objects? Are we talking about the cultural value of the objects exemplified in the work attached to the text in the announcement? I mean, to the, I'm, I'm sorry, the work attached to the text in the announcement. Or if we were to say cultural value in relationship to art objects, would we be saying something different? Would the objects presented in the work be considered art objects? Why not avoid this commodity discussion altogether? Why not just say objects or material objects? What I see here is a piece of furniture that supports three objects. A portable radio, also known as a boombox, 
next to two rubber masks of Yoda, a Star Wars hero. The furniture is not Baroque, Art Deco, nor was it designed by Mies van der Rohe. I designed it. It consists of lumberyard plywood assembled around a triangular volume structured around a 90 by 50 by 45 degree angles. It is plastic laminated on two sides with the third side exposed, revealing the makeup of the unit. Colored plastic veneer that functions like skin on a wooden structure. The objects sit on the shelf, exposed to the atmosphere and to the touch of the hand. They collect dust, they are not fixed, and are readily, and read, and are readily available to use. What can one do with these objects? Consider a work of art in the museum, a painting, a sculpture, a 16th century dress, a 20th century object. While it is displayed, it also has to be cared for. It must be registered, classified, crated, installed, deinstalled, stored, cleaned, repaired, protected. In this respect, care is a type of use. As the object is useful, it is used in a manner that is useful. Now consider my work, a work of art owned by an individual. It is in the home and it demands care and protection. The owner becomes the custodian of the work of art. And with that comes a certain degree of responsibility as well as anxiety because respect for the artist's intentions must be upheld. The work is accompanied with instructions for its installation in all of its parts. The objects must be arranged and placed in the prescribed order. But they're not fixed. They just sit there. What if someone were to move them, even use them, or unintentionally damage one of them? Furthermore, the objects have not been transformed into a more durable material. For instance, Jasper John's Ballantine beer cans that were cast in bronze and painted. The objects are each the thing itself. It's material as intended by its producer. As each material exists under the terms of its chemical components, each material will change differently with time, possibly with certain objects even decomposing. When you obtain something you like, you discover something you like about it. That's why you get it. If you find it in a store and can afford it, you have to pay for it. If you find it on the beach, most likely it's free. Purchasing an object you either need or desire, or both, does not mean you're engaging in capitalist venture. However, if you are an artist purchasing paint and canvas to make a work of art that you offer for sale in an art gallery, you are engaging in business. Does that mean, does that make your art a commodity? In our society, we wear shoes. What type of commodity is the shoe? It is, after all, at the base of our body. It is the shelf on which we stand. It is a sign of our, com I'm sorry, it is a shelf on which we stand. Is it a sign of our commodified identity? Are we identified by the shoes we wear? Over the years, I've done various works with shoes. Uh, this is a work that I did at Fashion Moda um, with a, a woman's shoe. I called it back then Egyptian shelf. This is a work that I made um, it has the same shoe, and it was made 27 years later. This is a work from 1985, um, Charm of Tradition. And here is a work uh, from 1987, titled Untitled, 
shoes with braces, wooden boots. In 1987, I was preparing for my show at Lea Ruma Gallery in Naples, Italy. Lea took me to the flea market. I returned with a child's chair and then and 10 pairs of children's sandals. The work was included in my show. Um, this is no wires, no power cord. There were several variants of this work. It was done, they were done in 1986. In 1986, I made several works with the newly produced basketball shoes. Thomas Crow had taken interest in this work when he wrote his essay for the Endgame catalog at the ICA Boston that year. 17 years later, uh, 17 years later, he returned to the work in his text, From Marks to Sharks, published in 2003 on the occasion of Art Forum's double issue on the 1980s. In a nutshell, Crow was attempting to tackle the question of Marx and capital in art. In an article, Farewell to an Identity, last December in Art Forum, the art historian critic Benjamin Buchlow discussed the symptoms of the common culture that emerged in the 1980s and stated, the first and perhaps the most startling symptom was the emergence of a hitherto, of a hitherto totally unknown social species, a new generation of artists. He compares the artists Jeff Koons, Damien Hirst, Takashi Murakami, and Richard Prince to Marx's term, lumpens, defined as the refuse of all classes. Why species? species? By the mid-1980s, it became clear that the everyday object condemned by art historian Clement Greenberg 40 years earlier to be kitsch, fetish, stupid, and hence external to any discourse within the museological script of art, had entered center stage. An unusual political ideological reaction followed. For some art historians, this condition became the end game of art. What, uh, what does this mean? As I was saying, I was invited to participate on a panel discussion at the ICA Boston 10 days ago. Helen Mollesworth asked me to talk about my work in the context of her exhibition, This Will Have Been, Art, Love, and Politics in the 1980s, as well as about the Endgame Symposium in 1986 at the ICA Boston. Helen visited me in December 2012, and one of the first things she said was, you know, there's been a backlash against the 80s. And she added, people were saying to me, why do a show about the 80s? Why not? For a show in 2005 about the 1980s titled Flashback, artists were asked to make a statement. Robert Gober says, Best to stay quiet about the 80s. I am considered to be an 80s artist, but I don't really think that it's that simple. The work on which my art is based developed in the late 1960s and throughout the 1970s. By 1978, I had articulated a concept of the object in contemporary life and art. It was based on the, on the democracy of objects, the things we make and use and love. From a theoretical point of view, to many artists and art historians, the question of the object in art 
and philosophy is among the most important issues today. In 1979, director Helene Wiener invited me to do a project at Artist Space in New York. There were several rooms and I chose the reception space. It was the first area you entered and the room behind was Helene's office. The blue minimal box was Cindy Sherman's desk. It was actually white. She was the receptionist. That was her job. I chose this space because it was a living, functional space. At an adjacent wall, I built a rectangular unit the scale of a cabinet to match the desk, and I placed a, a water kettle on it. A year earlier, a year earlier, I began to make installations that I titled displays. This work was display number seven. The key to my practice was presentation. An exhibition in the home, the museum, etc., is a presentation, an anthropological entity that, that's communal and collective. Frederick Jameson describes this approach to material objects as, quote, allegorical interpretation. He added, it's an interpretive operation which begins by acknowledging the impossibility of interpretation in the older sense. Those objects, along with their labels, are now profoundly relational. The objects you see in display number seven were borrowed from family and friends. Four North, East, South, West, a show I had at the Neuer Berliner Kunstverein Berlin and at the Haus der Kunst in Munich in 2000, the sociologist Valentin Rauer wrote, whether the glass vases are arranged on the shelf symmetrically in threes or asymmetrically in twos, whether the vases are standing on doilies or whether the objects mix well with glass objects. According to Kant, this aesthetic judgment is so subjective, arbitrary, and banal that we can safely forget it. And yet to ask as Steinbach does about the aesthetic relationships between people and their objects means to turn the Kant formula on its head or rather on its feet. It is therefore eye-opening to recall the groundbreaking study of the phenomenon of taste by the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu. Both Steinbach and Bourdieu invert the view of an apparent banality of thing relationships. The Binational, a show of American and German art took place in 1988-89 at the ICA Boston and the Kunsthalle Dusseldorf. The American side was curated by Trevor Fairbrother, David Jostlit, and Elizabeth Sussman. Elizabeth interviewed me for the catalog. This work, Code of Silence from 1987, was exhibited in the Binational. In 1984, I came up with a wedge-shaped shelf. The structure evolved after a search for a place, for placement of objects, something between furniture and sculpture, indeed something in between, hence the wedge. For me, this shelf was an architectural device, a musical instrument. You could modulate the size of the sections which all had the same geometrical proportions and were sized in relation to the objects they supported. Apparently, Hans Hacke found my device useful because he used it to make his work, the Sachi Collection, Simulations, in 1987. Just a year before, I was a total non I, just a year before, I was a total non-entity in the art world, and Hans Hacke was a powerfully established artist with a huge following in the critical elite art historical establishment. What was Hans Hacke doing, and why? In 
In 1990, Kirk Varnado, chief curator of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, mounted the exhibition High Low. Hakesachi work, Hakesachi work was reproduced in the catalog. Varnado wrote, quote, Hake produced an artwork that consisted of unflattering photographs of Sachi and sloganeering wall labels that attacked him. Unsophisticated people might have called it an advertising campaign. And he attempted to demonstrate that Sachi was out to demoralize avant-garde art in the interest of international capitalism. Well, what kind of advertising campaign do we have here regarding my work? In the mid-80s, the mid-80s witnessed a seismic shift in the art market for contemporary art. Certain older, artists, certain older artists' market value, as well as that of some younger unknown ones, suddenly increased dramatically. For instance, the German painter Gerhard Richter, who we hardly heard of in the 70s, suddenly became highly sought after. This brought about a crisis, a crisis that unsettled many art historians. Soon, they were debating whether the artists were complicit with the capitalist market and labeling the new work commodity art, simulations, as well as cynical. To this end, David Jostley, to this end, David Jostley took a position and stated in, in his catalog essay that the artists in Endgame were not cynical. A new focus on the role of the object in contemporary art had emerged in 1985-86. The curator Gary Garrels was on mark when he curated the show New Sculpture, Robert Gauber, Jeff Kuntz, Heim Steinbach at the Renaissance Society in Chicago in the spring of 1986. Gary had planned a panel discussion with the artists to take place on the evening of the opening. Instead, he met me upon my arrival midday and informed me that Bob and Jeff had come earlier to hang their works in the show and had left town. Why did they leave town? Endgame was the last in a series of shows in 1985-86 that addressed the question of the object. Endgame was not really about the exhibited art. Endgame was a symposium having to do with the dilemma the historians were having. I'm sorry, the dilemma the historians were facing. Their names are on the catalog cover. As with chess, Endgame was conceived as the play of ending the game. There are two sides. One, the art historians, the other, the artists. In a major art historical publication in 2004 titled Art Since 1900, this very same leading art historians canonize Endgame in a chapter titled 1986 Endgame Reference and simulation in recent painting and sculpture. Um, sorry, the title is 1986 Endgame Reference and Simulation in Recent Painting and Sculpture opens in Boston. As some artists play on the collapse of sculpture into commodities, others underscore the prominence of design and display. In essence, the chapter is an attempt to lay out the author's theory of institutional critique and its superiority to other artistic practice, practices. At the outset of the chapter, the writers who were Hal Foster, Rosalind Krauss, Eva Lanbois, and Benjamin Buchlaw state, in the early 80s, artists like Jeff Koons and Heim Steinbach equated artworks with commodities directly. This work first came to broad attention in a 1986 show titled Endgame at the Institute of Contemporary Art in Boston. This is simply not true. 
artworks were not being equated with commodities. Rather, everyday, rather, everyday objects were equated with art objects. The key example of the author's thesis of, I'm sorry, the key example of the author's thesis is a work related and different that I made in 1985. They do not provide the reader with an image of the work, but instead present A Pig in Formaldehyde by Damien Hirst. Why that pig? Is it piggy bank, a capitalist pig, or simply a metonym for greed? Here's what they say about my work. A 1985 piece titled Related and Different displays a pair of Nike basketball shoes alongside five plastic goblets, as if to suggest that Air Jordans were a contemporary version of the Holy Grail. This is typical of his work, to set selected products in a way that shows them to be related and different. Related as commodities, different as, as signs. Looking at a photograph of the work related and different, the writers mistook a pair of basketball shoes for the corporate signifiers of Nike and Air Jordans. They also mistook five brass candlesticks of Indian origin, designed after the motif of the lotus flower, for five plastic goblets. They fabricated an endgame. They fabricated an endgame fiction of signs projecting the Christian myth of the Holy Grail. They suggest that I frame art objects when in fact I present mostly common everyday objects drawn from our socio-cultural environment. They identify the work as commodity sculpture and explain it in terms of a closed system of signs as if that were a natural given. In support, they quote Benjamin Buchlaw who proclaims that I pretend to engage in a critical annihilation of mass cultural fetishization and reinforce the fetishization of the high cultural object even more. Not a single discursive frame is undone. Not a single aspect of the support system is reflected. Not one institutional device is touched on. What is he talking about? Is this an example of serious art historical thinking, or is it more, or is it no more than ideological propaganda? Helen Mollesworth, this will have been art, love, and politics in the 1980s, is a welcome and serious attempt to begin to rewrite the history of the art of the 1980s, to unravel the many contradictions of that extraordinary time in the history of contemporary art. All right. Well, thank you, Chaim. I think it's a good time to open the floor up for some questions. I noticed that um, in looking at your work, uh, a lot of the objects you described have a new appearance. They're, they're very clean. You know, they don't look worn or used. Um, and I was wondering if, you know, what, what, if you could maybe talk a little bit about that. Uh, and, and well, um, of course. You know, uh, just think about walking down the streets of New York. Now, you may see some garbage on the street, and occasionally I picked out something out of the garbage. Um, and, um, but you pass by a lot of stores, and there are things presented, displayed, uh, you know, for you to see. And you spend a lot of time walking in and out of stores as you go down the street. 
Occasionally, you may go to Central Park, you know, get an ice cream and sit down and listen to the birds. But, you know, usually you walk between one institution and another, from the school to the uh, vendor, you know, to get your package sandwich, you know, or maybe you prefer the uh, health food sandwich that's uh, homemade, a little more expensive. Um, so the things that, uh, that, you know, that are that <coughs> from our hands, in and out, uh, in that sense, um, you know, they come out of, you know, the uh, things that we produce. Uh, now you may say, uh, but don't we have things at home uh, that are used and so on. Uh, well, I, uh, I have used some of the black pictures that you saw on the shelf that I mentioned that have been in my house for a long time before the other artists came together. Um, and I did use some of them, and I did them for a long time. I had a whole bunch of them. Uh, I had the shelves uh, in my studio, and they certainly were used by some living uh, being, uh, living thing, whatever, animal. Um, and, uh, you know, there were works that came into my, there were works that come, there, I'm sorry, there are objects that come into my work that, uh, you know, have come from sources uh, uh, that have a history of use. You know, for instance, uh, a potty chair, a school bench. Uh, that potty chair was bought in an antique store. It was really a rather uh, old and somewhat crummy used object, but I found it beautiful. Um, and the school bench, which was uh, probably either an early uh, 20th century school bench, uh, was bought in a antique store in Bordeaux. So it's not exclusively, you know, uh, new objects, you know. But mostly yes, and mostly yes, that's what at least I found um, a day. What was the first one? Sorry. Um, I, I was wondering what was the first occasion or opportunity on um, which you could kind of contest uh, the ideological art historical narrative that you were kind of uh, talking about tonight? And uh, if you felt frustration in the 1980s, if this frustration was generalized and if you talked about it with other artists? It's a good question. <laughs> the answer is basically no, no, no. <laughs> and this is kind of shocking. Um, you know, at least the artists that I've known have been, uh, you know, um, encountering um, were, you know, very serious. And uh, many of them were smart thinkers. Uh, and you'd assume that some of them would speak out. And some of these artists that you've heard of, you know, uh, are friends of mine. And a few of them I've known for ages. We never talk about that. Um, and, uh, but I know that some are very upset. And some just don't care. Um, so that's really a very interesting question. Um, what can I say um, about this? Um, I can tell you that some artists disappeared, they just left. Uh, they left now. They're still working, but they are, for instance, Maya Weizmann, we never hear of him anymore. And he was a good artist. He happened to be a very young guy and a very smart guy who opened a gallery in this village. And it was one of the most interesting galleries in this village. And a lot of famous artists today showed their first time like Jeff Koons and Ashley Bickerton, and Richard Prince had a show there, even though he was showing the metro pictures, he wasn't happy with metro pictures, you know? So he went with these young guys and the show there too. Um, and so Meyer was actually brilliant. Uh, he was also a very good artist. Um, I guess being a dealer, he was involved with collectors, you know? And there was a very heated uh, uh, collector world, you know, in New York City. Um, so I don't know what, you know, I don't know uh, 
how he was being perceived, you know, as a, uh, except that, um, you know, pretty negatively in the end. Um, and, uh, you know, someone like Peter Holly mentioned in the 90s that uh, he, you know, he may as well drive a cab to make a living, which I found was shocking because it's one thing to, uh, I always saw my work as, look, I'm putting objects on the show. It's kind of tough stuff in the sense that you're going to buy these objects that were sold before and they are here to sell again. Peter was making paintings. You know? uh, I was just shocked when he said that. I think he said something like that at the talk, also in a show about the 1980s, uh, that was around 2000, uh, curated by Carol and Chris Bacardi at the PS1. I think there was a panel discussion. Maybe that's when he said that. Um, so, it is kind of shocking that uh, there's been no discussion. Uh, but I think that that kind of discussion was very unwelcome. And, uh, um, and I, I'd say it's pretty complicated. Anyone else? Okay, maybe Professor. You could use the mic. They actually can't hear us next door, so. My first question was wondering if you've ever got to uh, encounter Hans Hakka and to have a conversation about the image that you showed up of his before. And then a second question, if you care to answer it, was I was just, because I had recently seen the 1993 show at the New Museum, and I was wondering if you had taken that in and if, what, what, what uh, mm -hmm. thoughts you had about that show in retrospect. Sure, yeah. Okay. Um. Oh, oh boy, okay. I didn't know I should stand there. I was, you know, pretty kind of felt confined. And <laughs> I feel a little bit more like nice to move around. Um, yeah, good question about Hans. Let me tell you something about Hans Hacke. I was a graduate student in 1970, from 71 to 73 at Yale University. Hans Hacke had a show coming at the Guggenheim Museum. The show was canceled. We were all outraged, you know, just like the 1968 revolution. We were ready to walk out on the streets with posters. That's what Hans, what Hans Sake was to us. You know? So uh, an important artist, you know, who, um, you know, was, uh, you know, shut out of having a show because he did a work that was uh, critical uh, of society, of, of an individual, of the museum, whatever. Um, so that was my experience of Hans Hacke. So obviously, if somebody that we looked up to, like anyone else who was writing an intelligent, interesting, challenging text in art form. These are the people you would have liked to meet and see your work and give you their opinion and so on. And hopefully include you in a show. Um, so, no, I, 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 the first time I ever saw Hans Hacke in person was when he walked into Jay Gorney Modern Art in a leather jacket to check out my work, I guess. I remember we were standing at the counter and was passing by and he said, that's Hans Hacke. Um, I don't know exactly the timing of, the, 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 the work that he did was pretty early. I mean, when I say early, um, as I said earlier, uh, in the fall of 1985, um, I knew a few artists, and I've been in a few small group shows, but you know, people didn't know. I, I wasn't in the world, in that sense, you know? And his work was made in 1987. Sometimes around that time, and I think it was after that, he called me, and he offered me a job, you know, a part-time job at Cooper Union, where he was a you know, fixed professor or instructor or teacher, he's been there for many years, so it was like ten years. And I taught before in the 70s, and at that point, you know, we just, I thanked him. And I was actually flattered that he called me, and now I'm trying to understand whether he called me after he made that piece, because maybe I wasn't aware of it, you know, until a certain point later, that he had done that piece. Um, so that's as far as, I've met him, yes, we said hello at an opening of the Bechers at Sonovan Gallery, where I'd shown. Um, and um, that's about it. Maybe Professor Slocum. I wonder if um, 
the term or designation realism or realist means anything to you in your practice? And I say that first because of your response to the first question, the way you described how your choice of, of clean objects, you know, is a response to our, our environment, that there's some correlation between what you're presenting and what you see in the world. And also, I think, more uh, strongly in terms of the narrative that you're uh, in some ways trying to um, um, differentiate uh, your work from, that is to say, what I would call a modernist account that it wants to see your work as critical or um, see it as um, institutional critique, these, these kind of um, accounts that um, are all about a kind of problematic relationship between the sign and the signifier. In, in some ways, I wonder if, if, if you see that relationship not as problematic as some of your um, um, interlocutors might have presented it. You know, the, that discussion is fascinating. Uh, so, of course, I'm fascinated by it, and I've thought about it. Uh, when I, um, maybe I was just naive, but when I, uh, first of all, uh, the, for the first five years that I was working with objects and doing installations, most of the objects that I was using were used. Shelf with Ajax, that's a used can of Ajax. And all those other objects were used, generally. Um, and so, when I moved into uh, beginning to bring in, in objects and including them in the work that came out of the store that were brand new, um, I was kind of shifting into that territory of exploration. And even at that time, I would include <coughs> used objects, <coughs> you know, with new objects. At my show in 1987 at Sonderman Gallery, I'd say at least a third of the works included uh, either used objects or objects that were, you'd call antiques. Like there was a, uh, a children's uh, horse made out of, maybe made in the 40s. You know, it was all kind of used and, and old. It was on wheels. It's a charming object that really used. And it was in one of the works. Um, and the, the object next to it was, um, and a, a kind of a folk artwork that was a twig of a man that looked like he was masturbating. It was done by an artist, an artisan. I bought it in an antique store. And, um, and the woman who sold to me said to me uh, something like, this is an erotic man. And um, so, you know, it's not that it, the work excluded uh, these others. Now, regarding the... <clears throat> Uh, sign, you know, and, you know, signifier, signified, and that discourse. Well, that was there in the 80s. Uh, uh, that was a very interesting uh, and very focused on uh, territory to to uh, to think about. Uh, we all read simulations by Baudrillard, and everybody talked about Baudrillard. So you had to know a little bit something about it to know what they're talking about it if you were at all out there with your ears open. Um, but. What I can say about that is that it was greatly misunderstood. You know, and I would even say that, in many ways, Baudrillard greatly mi misunderstood himself. I mean, he was pretended to be an artist, to be a specialist in art. You know? And um, you know, it's like me pretending to be a specialist philo philosopher, you know, because I like philosophy, and because I read some more, or sociology. So, um, but I don't go talking about, you know, writing critiques, you know, about philosophy and sociology. Um, so, so I think it's problematic. So I don't know if I'm, I'm getting into the territory of your question. I'm sure I'm not giving you an answer. I guess I, in terms of realism, that, that you see your practice in some ways as representing the world. Oh, the word was realism. Okay. Um, yeah, what is real? Um, so. What makes the work real is that these are actual existing things that are physical and in the world. And that's what the work is. But most people see the work through pictures. And then they talk about it through pictures. And if they are art historians and talk about it through pictures, I think it's their responsibility to double check you know, what the objects are that they are looking at and what the material of the objects are, because these are material objects. So I think that has to be really problematic when 
you know, when uh, a total misreading of the material is being promoted under some kind of a fictive uh, narrative. Um, so again, what is real? Um, so I, I would say what is real is uh, what is present and uh, what is the closest to us. But even that is reality. We trust that that piano is real. But how do we know until we play the keys? Maybe there are no keys in there. Maybe it's just a water fountain. When you lift the top, you know, the water starts pouring down. I mean, we, we trust that it is because of the context. So there's a lot of, you know, we project reality. Um, yeah, there's a philosophy today that what's real are the objects, and the objects are really, uh, you know, the, the message comes first with the objects, the question of object-subject relationship, as if the object has a subject. I just want to thank you, first of all, thank you so much for sharing so much with us. I have um, about 40 questions, so I'll just pick one. Um, I guess my biggest astonishment today is how much you talked about people talking about your work. Okay. I'm wondering... Um, I think I talked a little bit about my work. You did? <laughs> Um, and the way that I see it. Yes. Does, does the way that other people, in particular art historians and people who write about art, interpret your work change what you've done? Why is it so important to you that they get it right, sort of? Well, you know, the first answer is they got it so wrong. And it's historicized, and I gave you examples. But that isn't new. That's, well, it's not new, nothing is new, you know? No, that's been so, going on since, it so has to be. The second point is, as, as, as Duchamp said, you know, the object doesn't live or doesn't mean anything without the, an audience. It, it, the, the audience completes the object. So you get, you know, history gets rewritten because the audience has changed. Things are being seen differently and reinterpreted. Uh, and if there's something there to be reinterpreted, it's there, and eventually somebody catches it. Um, so, um, at this point, and there was another question. You're saying to me, why are you talking about the way that people are responding to your work? And the other question that came from the other side was, why haven't you talked about the way people respond to your work? Why haven't your colleagues talked about it all these years? And that's the problem of the question. Why? Why isn't there a discourse and a dialogue? You know, now, here's the thing. We may disagree with somebody's work. We may disagree with somebody's reading of the work. But if you have serious people making art, and year after year, and decade after decade, they're still around, and the work is building interest, why is it so slow for the discussion to open? What, you know, why is it so slow for the discussion to open, you know? What are the vested interests that are holding back? Um, but again, going back a few years, um, why, why aren't some of those artists engaged? You know? Why isn't Meyer Weisman engaged? Why doesn't, doesn't somebody call Meyer Weisman and ask him to talk about International Women's Monument in the 1980s and what that meant and the artists that he worked with? I mean, they're very important artists. It was a very important place. No? Well, there are lots of artists that I've met who create, and it has a meaning to them, and they put it out into the world. They don't just stay at home with the door closed. Once they put it out into the world, many artists that I've known feel that it's no longer their control. It's no longer theirs to control, that you can say what it means to you, but as soon as you put it into a space with another human being or other human beings, they bring something to it that you might not. It isn't right or wrong, it's just another reaction, another interpretation, and not something that you can get right or wrong. Okay, so what's your point? 
I'm just wondering why it matters so much to you that people seem to have gotten it wrong. I, I'm just surprised by that, that's all. Well, I thought I already gave an answer. Is, you know, and also you gave examples. You know, one reason that one doesn't talk about it is because we are all sensitive to understand that we are not the only ones. That's why we don't bring it up. We know that our other artists work very hard and they think that the work is important and it's not shown or not received or misinterpreted. So we know we're not the only ones. So we stay a little humble and we keep our mouths shut. And we let everybody interpret the way they want to, you know? But you know, there comes a point when you have to take responsibility for yourself. And this is the occasion that I decided to take responsibility for myself. And I've not done it before. And as I answered you before, you know, why not? You know, there comes a time when you have to stand for yourself. And I think that my work is uh, out there enough, discussed enough, misinterpreted enough, that it's time that the discussion should, stop, should open. And I know it's already opening, you know, but you know, I don't know how many, how many more years I have to stay around, you know? And, uh, and so may as well, you know, uh, see if I can contribute something, you know, and take the risk.